Tonight's talk is Dulwich's European community, and the aim is to show you that Dulwich has been European uh, for well over a hundred, well over a hundred years, 150. So on our title shot, on the left, we have uh, the family of a bank manager called Eberhard Fock, and the house is in number 31 Sydenham Hill, long demolished, I'm afraid. Uh, we will meet him later. Uh, and on the right, likewise, you will see her again. That is Gertrude Bing of the Warburg Institute, although that particular shot was taken in Germany. But she moved to East Dulwich Grove um, just before the war. So just to bring you up to date, just to show you that Dulwich is still um, European. Uh, this photograph was taken a week or so ago at the Oktoberfest at the Judith Kerr School in Hearn Hill. And the gentleman there is, as you can see, suitably, suitably attired for the occasion. And there's the beer, drinking a beer at the same time. This is a statement from Charles Booth, his survey into life and labour of the peoples of London. And this is how he described the German colony in Camberwell. And this is one of the points we want to make. Their sons are more English than the English themselves in games and dress. And part of the story we're going to tell tonight is how um, they the Europeans came over and anglicised themselves within just one and at the most two generations. But the key reason, why did they come to Dulwich? Partly because it was high, height is good, the atmosphere is better. It was near London, near the centre of London, where most of their businesses were, because they were businessmen. Um, and of course, there were some big houses. Uh, and most of them were fairly wealthy. So um, a good combination, good location, easy, easy access to London. And most of them had their own carriages. They didn't have to worry about trains and decent houses. And this is the key thing, is the Windsor Road Church, which is the German church. And most of them were Germans. We will discuss other nationalities, but most of them were Germans. And I can describe to you a wedding. The South London Press described the wedding on the 6th of May, 1876, saying the pretty little German evangelical church in Denmark Hill presented an unusually gay appearance, the occasion being the solemnization of the marriage of the youngest son of Mr. de Claremont of Avenue House, Grove Lane, to Miss Hilgers, daughter of Mr. F. W. Hilgers of Champion Hill. Bright sun such as this is only seen in the month of May. A fresh, pleasant air and the smiling faces of innumerable friends were a welcome accompaniment to the joyous ceremony. And if those omens are worth anything, then the future of the two who were thus joined should be one of unclouded happiness. We don't know whether that was the case. The church was decorated with excellent taste. Arches composed of flowers, azaleas, roses, lilies of the valley and geraniums had been constructed over the aisle leading to the altar. The windows had similar decorations. Festoons of evergreens were hanging over the communion table and indeed the whole interior was a perfect garland. Then says the bridal party proceeded to the home of the bride's father at Champion Hill, where the large company sat down for an elegant dejeuner. The health of the newly married couple was, of course, enthusiastically drunk, and after the departure for the honeymoon, the rejoicings of which were on such a scale of magnificence, not often seen in South London, were continuing throughout the day. The presents, we might add, were of an unusual number and elegance. So a rich wedding in a small church. So the first thing we're going to do is look at a couple of Dulwich College teams. This is the first 11 of 1878, and it included, as I've said, Gottfried Kopke here, and F.A. Del Comin behind him. I rather like the, the master in his bowler hat with his moustache. But this is a very sort of casual, casual picture. And here we have the first rugby of first 15 rugby of 1887. It could have been, it almost could be like American football, couldn't it, with their striped jerseys and the socks and boots. And the chap we're looking at here is Willem Staats, who's a Dutch, Dutch. His father was Dutch. He is Dutch. Father was a commission merchant and agent for the Bavarian Susna Crayon Company. 
and as an aside, also a patent holder for an improvement in skirt borders. But this is it. Here are the Continentals playing British games. But we're going now to the First World War, who obviously being German was perhaps not a, a good idea. And there was a letter in the Times from Sir Arthur Pinero asking uh, nationalized British citizens of German origin to make public statements of their loyalty. And what you see below is a letter which was written and then repeatedly uh, repeated in the Times over several days and signed by many of the naturalized Germans who lived in Dulwich. So they were covering themselves. And here is what a lot of them did. You can see here Henry Gogol Schmidt changes his name to Henry Gogol Smythe. And he writes to the, he lives on Hearn Hill, 131 at the bottom of Hearn Hill, just below the church. Um, and he writes to the <coughs> state um, to say, I've now changed my name. So Gogol Smythe, so he's no longer Schmidt. And here we are in Frankfurt Road. Now, Frankfurt Road is named after Frankfurt House, um, and Frankfurt House was named after Frankfurt because the owner of the house, uh, Christopher Hain, or Hahn, came from Frankfurt. And you can see that the residents here are pretty unhappy about the, the name, and they, they write to the Camberwell Borough Council saying the name's got to change uh, to something more suitable, Belgian or Dutch. Um, and um, but the council says no, and of course we still have Frankfurt Road today. But there it is, taken in about 1900. Now these we're coming on now to a couple of, on the face of it, Germans who were who fought for the British Army. But of course their parents are Germans, and we'll come on to a Spanish one. And uh, Paul Lieutenant Wismann. Uh, his parents lived at College Row at Bell House, um, was the first Dulwich College boy to be killed in the first, he was the first, in the World War One. He was killed on the 15th of September, if you remember the war started, I think on 3rd or 4th of September, so he was killed on the 15th of September, there he is. He was a married man at the time, his daughter was born after, born after his death, um, and there he is in the Dulwich College photograph of the time. So he's the German, and here we have Second Lieutenant Eustace Fernando Larena, who lived in East Dulwich Grove, who was born in Spain. His father was a Spanish electrician uh, working in this country. And there he is there. And this shot here uh, is of the school, of, the, of his class at uh, Dulwich College. Thank you, uh, Dulwich College Archives, for telling us this. And four of these boys were killed in World War I. And now we're moving to, not necessarily funnier, but a um, slightly different, different take. And we have here Albert Jungermann. Uh, Albert Jungermann was the director of the International Ink Ribbon Company in Clerkenwell Green. And there is still a, um, a build, the, his building is still there. Well, he's not there, but his building is still there. And he was obviously pretty prosperous, and he was living at 12 Alain Road, picture there. And uh, he was married to an English woman, and his four children, two of his sons, went to the college. And as the thing says, he was charged on remand that being an en en enemy alien, he failed to report himself under the alien restriction order. So um, he was obviously doing a, I mean, the government needed typewriters, typewriter ribbons, so he was seen as doing the important job. But being a German, he had to uh, tell the authorities if he was travelling, and he went up to Birmingham. And while he was up for four days, that was fine. He had his permit for that, but he decided to go and visit his father-in-law, and he was uh, and he stayed with his father-in-law for a couple of days. And of course, that wasn't approved, and so that's why he ended up in court. But the interesting thing um, is he was up there. I mean, the house, it's, it's quite a substantial house in Allen Road today. So he was a fairly rich man and he engaged um, a prominent QC, Henry Burkett, who went on to become, and that's, sorry, Norman Burkett, and that's the picture there, who went on to become uh, a very highly regarded barrister and one of the English judges at the Nuremberg trial. 
Younger man was fined £100 and ordered to provide £500 uh, in his own recognizance. He continued to live at uh, Alain Road uh, for quite a while after the war. So the business, so it didn't affect his overall business. And here we have Leo Schlentheim, or Leo Seaholm, as he changed his name to. Um, he was, uh, he'd come over from, from Germany and was one of the founder members of the, of the Automobile Association. And that's a picture of him in his car, in his 24 horsepower moors. And you can see here, he was, um, he driven, uh, he, he drove through Europe in 1902, not necessarily in that car, I don't think. Uh, so he was a pretty um, game, uh, game driver, and these are all his clubs. And he finally ended up in the cinema business or kinema business. And you can see here that the, uh, he went bust in the First World War, um, possibly because of anti-German sentiment. We don't really know. He changed his name, Leo Siho. I mean, it was uh, not an obvious German name, but he, he, he held a number of cinemas and he died. In fact, he had a heart attack on London Bridge in his car in 1916. We'll go now to Melrose in College Road, uh, long since demolished, and we'll meet the Rongas, uh, who were the directors of sugar importers, Polme and Ronga. And there were questions in Parliament uh, as to why the government was using a German firm to buy sugar for the war effort. And the minister, uh, the minister response was put under some pressure. And there's quite a long um, thing in, in Hansard and, uh, about uh, the minister responding, saying, uh, you know, this is not a German firm. It's got a German name, but these people are naturalized Britons. There is no way that the government would be dealing with German firms in World War I. Runga's son, um, son married this lady here, who was the MP for Rotherhide between 1931 and 1935, Nora Runge. Um, and I like this bit here, 1935, she asked the Minister of Transport to take steps to effect the closing of certain streets, or we call them play streets today, although she said in the poorer districts, uh, for two hours in the evening so that children can play in them without risk of accident. Um, she didn't actually live in Dulwich, but um, the connection is there. She was quite a well-known MP. But that's, we're new moving, sorry, we're moving now up to, um, up onto Sydenham Hill. And here we have a Crescent Wood Road. Um, the house is better known, of course, for, um, John Logie Baird, um, and that's a picture taken in the 30s, and there is John Logie Baird's son, but that's a different, we're not talking about him, we're talking about the Orenschlagers, who, are, who came, who had business in the Far East, uh, and they had an office in Boltoff Lane. As you can see here, when Orenschlager Senior came over, uh, he got naturalized pretty quickly in 1866, and there's his certificate. Um, and his two sons went to college, Dulwich College. The first one was Julius George, named after him, but slightly anglicized, Olin Schlager, um, who joined his father's firm. But the interesting thing is his grandson, who was Commander Norman Albert Gustav Olin Schlager, who was quite a well-known Royal Navy captain in the First World War. And his great-grandson was Brigadier Richard Norman Olin Schlager, uh, who served in World War II. And the interesting thing here is that the Olin Schlagers didn't feel the need to change their name. And I think it's uh, quite interesting to see the German name in, in the British Navy and the British Army. So we've had enough of Germans for a short while. We're going to look at some other nationalities uh, who lived in, in Dulwich and in the order of Polish, Russian, French, Swiss, Austrian, Irish, Danish, and Dutch. And we'll start with Leon Wannake, uh, who's Polish. Uh, he lived in Champion Hill. And he's best known as a, um, in the field of photography. Um, he won, he won, um, he was a pioneer inventor in this. And for improving the production of silver bromide emulsion, he received in 1877 a prize from the Association Belge de Photographe, and uh, in 1882 the Royal Photographic Society of Great Britain awarded him with a progress medal for all his work. So he was a very well, 
well-known uh, man in the photography trade, but, but he was actually far more than that. Um, he was a, before, of course, Poland, when he was in Poland, of course, that was part of Russia, and he was an anti-Tsarist revolutionary, and he had to leave in a hurry. And uh, he used his photographic skills to become a forger. And he's known that he, it's known now that he was the kingpin, a loose group of anarchists and ex-communards who forged various East European banknotes, especially Russian rubles. So he was, he was um, best known as a photographer, but he was in fact a serious forger. And then we have Gustavus Adolphus Kino, another Polish man, um, again comes over pretty and gets national, naturalized pretty quickly. Uh, he's a tailor, and as you can see, he has here a, a design for a class ball fastener. And he lives at Streatham House at 13 Alley Park, picture here. Here's an advertisement, um, of one of his shops. Um, and here's interestingly, a newspaper article about he left, when he died in 1909, he left nearly 130,000 uh, pounds. And it's interesting to say he's directed his trustees to keep his subscription to the two seats in the synagogue. So he was definitely Jewish, whereas all the Germans were Protestants. Um, and this we think, uh, Sharon and I between us have not been able to find any reference or any shots of his shop or any advertisements, but we think this is his brother, Alfred M. Kino, who was also in the clothing trade, uh, but didn't live here. And this is a great shot of the tennis court at Streatham House, where I don't know which boy it is, but Algernon Rid Roderick Kino, one of his sons, um, and here you go, had a, a prominent career in the army. So second generation Polish, it becomes British, and he's in the East Yorkshire Regiment and wins the DSO in the First World War, just before, in the First World War in 1915. So we're now moving to Russians, and we're going up onto Crescent Wood Road again. Nicholas Chevalier at Ashmore, well-known artist. Uh, not so much here uh, in England, or he was in mid-Victorian times, born in Australia. The Buffalo Rangers is the first uh, picture to be hung in the National Gallery of Australia in Melbourne and was um, uh, when the gallery was set up the Australian government had a sort of said um, you know uh, there was an exhibition of paintings and the one that went for the most said they said they would have most money they would hang up and this sold for 200 pounds and they hung it in the in the museum but uh, but uh, our friend here Chevalier also painted for Queen Victoria. He was well known in royal circles and painted various archduke and duchesses and things. So quite a well-known artist. And, uh, and here we have a rogue, I suppose, of uh, Count Serge de Bolotov. We say Russian, could have been Bulgarian. Nobody's really quite sure. The picture on the left shows him uh, and he married the daughter of um, Selfridge who, who did the Selfridge department store. Um, and he was, in, he was into um, designing and building aeroplanes, not very successful, you have to say. Uh, but he lived in Kingswood House for a while, just before the First World War. He, was, he and his mother, who's a, who's a Russian princess, were always suing various people. And he was clearly uh, a slightly shady operator. Uh, but an interesting character nevertheless. And there was a recent article uh, in the Dulwich Society Journal about him. Rudolf Neil is another Russian and he lived at Red Home in 92 College Road, the last house in College Road to be demolished for what is Dulwich Oaks. And the site's claim to fame is of course, is that's where Pissarro painted uh, looking down onto Alain Park. That's where the actual shot was taken from in the 1870s. And this is just a little thing to show that all Russians were not rich or I mean, quite a few of them were crooks. And this is an, um, an illustrated police news article about a break in at Arden in College Road. Uh, as they say, College Road is a secluded thoroughfare running from Dulwich toward Crystal Palace and containing a number of large residents standing their own ground, exactly, exactly so. Um, and George Whitfield, the night watchman, heard a noise in the veranda. 
and saw this bloke, they chased after him and found him in the elm to the rich Russians. And here we have Alfred E. Brandt, although with a name like that, you would think Russian. Uh, but he was born in St. Petersburg. Um, uh, William Brandt, but of German, he was of German um, heritage and he came over to London and set up the William Brandt and Sons Bank, uh, sort of slightly bijou bank with offices at 4 Fenchurch Street. Well, we'll see 4 Fenchurch Street later because there's, well, we think a lot of the wealthy Europeans in Dulwich knew each other and they certainly intermarried. There were also some quite close business relationships, uh, which we've only really been able to spot where we found that they were actually all working in the same building. So they must have known each other. Anyway, Alfred E. Brandt uh, from St. Petersburg. Uh, William Brandt and Sons um, was later, it's, it lasted quite a while, um, but um, its most famous, perhaps its most famous uh, employee was Lord Lucan. Uh, just before it closed up, he worked for Brandt and Sons. Now, Alfred E. Brandt's sister married Herman Lernus of Toksawa House. So we have a picture here of Toksawa House, albeit a later picture when it was a hotel, forget that bit, that's added on, but the house itself here. And of course, the property itself was one of the earliest houses in Dulwich leased to a German, to George van der Nuremberg, uh, in the, just before 1800. And here again, you see the Leonis, the two boys, one of the boys went to, two of the boys went to Dulwich College, and you could see he had a stellar career. First 15, first 11 in those three years, high jumper, editor of the Old Elanian, and vice president of the debating society. Uh, and the other interesting thing is Al poor Alfred uh, died relatively early in his mid 40s and his wife remarried a Frenchman, a French architect called Henri Favage. And Favage's business was in Egypt. And here you have the Luxor Hotel and the Mina House Hotel in Cairo. Um, so he was uh, a very well known, and that leads us naturally onto the French, and Dulwich's best known Frenchman is Noel Desenfant, the founder of one of the founders of the Dulwich Picture Gallery. Um, of course, there it is, there's the gallery, and there's where he's buried, or parts of him are buried. We all know, of course, that it was his wife who actually paid for it, um, but there he is, and he'd come over to France, and he's a picture dealer. Uh, with um, his, his protégé bourgeois, who although was of Swiss heritage, was actually born in England. So we have Noel Desenfants, our leading Frenchman. Another leading Frenchman in, was Alma Dolmetsch, um, musician, teacher of violin at Dulwich College, and, um, and the man who really we invented um, early English music, and here he is at the Elizabethan Stage Society about 1895. Um, he lived in, his biography suggests in Rosendale Road. Uh, Sharon and I have not been able to find him in Rosendale Road, uh, but he certainly lived in other roads in Dulwich while he was teaching at Dulwich College and before, what, uh, before he moved on to better things. More Frenchmen, this is, a pond house in Village Way, still there, still looking pretty much like that. Um, and the Marzettis, they were there in the middle of the 19th century, despite the name, they were French, they were Huguenots. And we have a picture here of John George and Mary de Wade Marzetti. And the interesting thing about the Marzettis is that we're not, we're not absolutely sure whether it was these, the daughters of these two, or sisters of uh, John George's brother, who were renowned as beauties in Dulwich. Um, and uh, they married somebody, one of them married um, into Bell House. So there's a Bell House connection all along here. So the French, and we go to the Swiss. Now we're in Burbage Road. You know where the doctor's surgery is in Burbage Road? And that's where Charles Nicolet lived. And he was the London partner of Messrs. Stauffra and some watchmakers and watch dealers, originally from Chaux de Fonds in Switzerland, centre of watchmaking in Switzerland. Uh, but he not only made his, they not only did they make their own watches, but they just imported one. 
perhaps one thinks today that you know names like Petit Philippe and um, you know valuable watches like that are relatively recent. Um, you know, people collecting relatively recent, but not so. He was importing them way before the turn of the the twentieth century. And uh, they're Stafford and Sons of Charterhouse Street. So he was at number two Burbage Road. And here we also have the Swiss. We have Florence Infern. Now the Inferns were a family who lived in several houses. They were in Hearn Hill, uh, in Champion Hill in Hearn Hill. Uh, they were in College Road. Uh, but the daughter, we have a nice picture of her, and she married a gentleman called Jean Louis Saudier, Siodé, uh, who was one of the founders of the Game of Association football and uh, represented the original Crystal Palace, Crystal Palace Club. Uh, when the laws of the game were determined, um, when the leading clubs led together in the 1860s. There we are, on the 5th of meeting, 1863. Um, unfortunately for all of them, the Imthern Bank went bust, and poor Siorde lost, lost all his money. They lived here in Allison Gardens on College Road. These all have, that's Allison Towers, this is Allison Gardens. Houses have long since been demolished. And now we have more Swiss, another rich man, Baron Alphonse Charles Jacques Alexandre Ruff, another banker uh, who moved to Dulwich, uh, Fairfield. That was the place. Look, there is a Fairfield in uh, Dulwich Village today, which is currently being rebuilt, it would seem. Um, last time I looked at it, it looked a pretty nice house. But if you look through it at now, it's next to the school. You can see right through it. Uh, everything is gone. All the floors have been removed. Anyway, this house was there before that one. And he moved here to educate his sons at Dulwich College. He literally was here between 1875 and 1880. There it is, the house next to the hall. Um, and here's a little bit of, um, he's left it on. He left it to, in 1881, once his children had finished the college, he Sold the lease to Henry Barrett, who met, who lived in Wandsworth and made bottled beer. But the more interesting thing is the connection here with uh, Crescent Wood Road again. Number one, Crescent Wood Road. The house is still there, built by the, the Charles Barry. Uh, it was owned by Pierre Morris Ruffer, and this is his other brother, who is who was uh, quite a well-known scientist. Interesting thing here is here is the house again and you can still see there's this art, little article here we have where the garage was extended in the coach house and if you go there today you can still see it but the house was let to an Australian Lily Playling a well-known singer and the first the first female singer to appear on radio she sang on Radio Luxembourg early in 1922 she was a very well-known singer at the time Changed to Austrian, coming a bit up to date, we have Alfred Lammer, or Alfred de Ritter von Lammer, as he was originally. Uh, he lived in Pickwick Road. He'd come over, he worked, he was Austrian, he was friends with the Von Trapp family, and the story is he actually took his driving test in Austria in Captain Von Trapp's car. He of, um, and uh, he'd come over to work in the Austrian tourist office in the early 30s, and stayed on, um, after Anschluss, after Germany took over Austria, he stayed on here and joined the, after all, he joined the Royal Air Force and won various medals. And after the war, he wrote a very well-known book on English stained glass, and he lived in Pickwick Road. And now let's move to the Irish. We have James O'Mara MP and his wife, Cashel, who lived at 100 College Road. These are, there's a picture of them. Looks a very prosperous, as he was, he was a bacon importer, an Irish bacon importer. So it wasn't Danish bacon in those days, it was Irish bacon. Here's old pictures of the house. And here, of course, is the house as it is today. And his wife was um, a suffragette. And she was secretary of the Dulwich branch of the New Constitutional Society for Women's Suffrage. So she was quite a well-known uh, suffragette. He was originally an Irish MP from 1900, 
He changed his allegiance to Sinn Féin in 1907 and 1908, and of course wouldn't sit then, although he was uh, elected as a Sinn Féin member of parliament, he wouldn't sit in parliament. And the interesting thing is the period that, the period when he didn't sit was when they moved here to Dunleaker. And the interesting thing is, well, we know he was there, uh, there's nothing in the directories to show that he was. So his name was omitted. He made sure his name was omitted from the directories, postal directories. Another Irishman living in Dulwichwood Avenue was James Stack Lauder, or James Lafayette, as he styled himself. Again, he was a photographer, very well-known society photographer in the late uh, 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, he called himself Lafayette because French, he thought French was a better, a better sales pitch, but in fact, he was an Irishman and that's him standing there. And here's a picture of Lily Langtree by Lafayette or by, by Landa. He was louder. He was a very, very successful, very wealthy man. Move Danish, we're here are the Del Comins, Ernest Del Comin at Enfield House in College Road at the Honorary, Honorable, Honorary Dalich Consul. We saw this picture earlier, his two sons at Dulwich College. And again, this is the shot of the, um, the first 11. And again, he was in the first 15 for four years, five years. Um, pretty, pretty, they were, they were pretty sporting. Again, the older Lanyon won the high, the place kick competition. I don't think they do that anymore. But Del Kerman's business was importing wheat uh, via Hull from Denmark, uh, wheat and uh, rapeseed from Denmark. And let's move to the Dutch. Most of you will know Glen Lee or Tappen House is it now, and it's uh, used in the war as the training for Dutch agents. And this is a shot of Bram Grisnight, who trained there and who was one of the few survivors dropped into Holland, captured by the Germans, but eventually uh, got away, released, uh, came back, married a British girl, and uh, recently visited Dulwich, and uh, where the society gave him a picture of the house. Dutchman again, Edward van Vliet, born in Rotterdam, 1831. Unfortunately, no pictures of him, but uh, his work you will all know because he was the builder of this style of house in Allen Road. He also built in South Croxford Road and in Sydenham. These shots of Laurie Park Avenue, you can see where he started in Laurie Park Avenue, and the house design is very similar. If you look here at the porches. Dulwich, it was the Dulwich Manor House estate. That was what he was, was working on. Uh, and he was a pretty prosperous builder, pretty good builder. Uh, and the estate were very pleased to have him to, to do it. He went bust in the end, as they all do. But uh, And here are a couple of his houses, and these are taken from Martin Carnaby's 1910 uh, sales particulars. You could have picked up that one for £1,200, and this one for £1,100. I think they'd be somewhat, somewhat more today. Uh, I think that will be a two or three million. But there we go. Also Dutch, Herman de Lange, a Dutch actor who came over to England um, and appeared with Tallulah Bankhead. In fact, this is, this is uh, Tallulah Bankhead with, um, I've forgotten his name. Uh, yes, Leslie. And uh, he was uh, quite a one and a bit part actor who sort of paid continental parts on the English stage for quite some time. But this is the this is uh, this is JC JTC Van Dulken, who was a very opinionated man, Dutchman, D Dutch businessman. In fifty years, he was a he was the uh, a warden a warder of the Dutch Church uh, in in the city. And uh, after fifty years, the newspaper went to see him and interviewed him and he said i've said you know you've been here 50 years what do you think and he said about the english people the characteristic the english people which have struck the most me most during my long stay amongst them are their patriotism and their benevolence which i think are wonderful 
in spite of all the criticism on hears of this modern age, there's just as much goodness in the world today as there was 50 years ago. But then he went on, then they asked him about his views on women. And he said, we hear so much of this cry for equality between, between men and women, but it seems to me that women always take the most comfortable and easiest jobs. If they won't really equality, want really equal, equality with men, they should be prepared to share all men's work and join the army and navy and work in the mine. I'm also one of those who believe that married women should not go out to work. Looking after home and children is quite enough to occupy a woman's time. And if she tries to continue her job, she's certainly not doing her duty. Uh, I doesn't say what Mrs. Van Dalken thought about it, but there she is. There's their house, pity about the bins. Uh, and there he is looking very prosperous. And of course, the other Dutch thing in Dulwich is the Dutch estate on East Dulwich Grove. We mustn't forget that. But let's move on. Again, not all Germans were rich. Uh, this is a report, newspaper report of Germans, uh, German burglars and um, shooting, shooting a police officer or wounding a police officer. Um, yeah, they're all being chased. It sounds it's all pretty desperate, uh, all in College Road and they, uh, they moved on. And it says here at the bottom, all three speak English. So you've got Gustav Franco, Frederick Braun, and Ernest Renta, all very young men. Quite why they were they were burglars, but but let's move on to the rich or not so rich. This is Ludwig Siegel, uh, who was the first uh, landlord at the Magdala uh, Magdala at two eleven Lordship Lane. Didn't last there long, but he'd come over from Germany as a jeweler, watchmaker. Uh, and then changed his career to become a, a landlord. And this is, this is taken about 1890, and you can see the bus stop where the bus started right outside. And then you have Anita Henkel, who ran a school. And here's a photograph of her school, the girls playing tennis, and there's the building. Um, special studies in languages, all these things, European history, current events. She must have been quite a difficult woman. She had a lot of uh, run-ins with the estate. Uh, this was the second or third house she um, bought on the estate and ran as a school. Uh, a tricky woman, I think. And the estate, yeah, they didn't get on. This is the Herschels. Herschels were fur, fur, huge fur business, Arthur Herschel, Arthur and Amy Herschel. And they lived at Bessemer House after Bessemer died. And these are just the great pictures, particularly Amy. Uh, that hat. Uh, but they were extremely wealthy. They had uh, the huge fur business all over Europe. Uh, here's Bessemer House. Here's their servants. There were just two of them. There were no children. So here were their servants lined up. And here gives you some idea of the interiors. Very, very well. And now we get back to Eberhard Fock and his family at Moss Grange. Uh, here's the family. He looks a very sad chap, but here's the house. And here's his um, car or carriage at the time, his private carriage to take him to work. And here's his office in the merchant bankers of Fruhl and Goshen at 12 Austin Prize, which is now the headquarters of the furniture makers livery company. And as I say, in the census thing, he called himself, first of all, a bank clerk and then a bank manager. In fact, he was the a director at Fruling and Goshen, who were one of the major um, boutique banks, if you like, city bank, city banks at the time, at the turn of the century. And he was also quite an adventurous. I picture, a picture here of his two daughters in close up. He sent them to the progressive Priorsfield School in Guildhall at uh, Guildford, which was set up by um, Julia Huxley. And there's a great picture online of Julia Huxley and Aldous Huxley uh, at the school. So he was quite a progressive, progressive man. And across, uh, not too far away, around the corner, of course, was uh, Baron Gustav van Lindenfels, Lindenfels, who was the German consul. There are many stories in Sydenham Hill 
of it being the German ambassador, of there being a residence of the German ambassador. This is as near as it got. It was the German consul. And here we have the short part of him leaving when he goes back to his home at Ansbach in Bavaria. And, but the house is still there. And we move down the hill to Augustus and Ellen de Chaperouge. Don't be fooled by the name. They weren't French. They were Germans. And they lived at Grovehurst in 8 Kingswood Drive. Our house is still there. And we have a great uh, quote of her car. This is a 24 horsepower Porthos. We can't say that is her. Um, we great if it was, but um, a report that in one of the little magazine there that she'd had this car delivered with particularly luxurious carriage work. What a, what a car. She must have been quite a character. And of course, around the corner, we have some August Mann, uh, conductor at the Crystal Palace, another German, came over here and made a career, made a very successful career. Herman Fort Large uh, of Messrs. Tepstorb and Company, another sugar importer who lived at um, Breakspear on College Road. Uh, and it, it's, uh, although obviously he did become a naturalized Briton, and he's another person who didn't change his name in the First World War, so he must have been considered okay. But interesting, when he, he calls himself John Henry Herman Fort Large in later life, but originally he was Johann Heinrich Herman Fort Large. And he was very proudly a subject of the Kingdom of Prussia uh, when he first moved here, but he clearly saw the writing on the wall. Um, and then we have Charles Adolf, Christoph Adolf Rader, Charles Adolf Rader, uh, very well known, one of the leading um, contributors to the to Dulwich College, a successful old boy. There he is, there's his house in Dulwichwood Avenue. And Gertrude Bing, she lived in East Dulwich Grove, and she was the director of the Warburg Institute. There is her house there, uh, behind the trees. And she came over to England just before the war and was the director, very successful director of the Warburg Institute after the war. Very stylish cigarette holder. And then we come to Frank Trier who was an engineer uh, and lived in Champion Hill. And of course is best known as, of German parentage, best known as the founder of Ruskin Park. Uh, picture here, and there a picture of the older park when it was founded in about 1912. And his other claim to fame was the first person to suggest um, the redevelopment of the Casino House estate uh, on on um, Garden City principles. He was always trying before the First World War to get the money together to do it, but never could quite make it work. So it wasn't until afterwards when we get the casino estate being built, which had nothing to do with him, uh, which we finally, he gets, uh, he gets what he wants. And to finish off, we're just going to go to the Klein Walks. There is Alexander Gerevorus Klein Walks house in the Glebe, uh, which is, um, just up the hill as you go up Dog Kennel Hill. This is his land down below, his farm down below. And you can see this is where the East Dulwich Estate was, where it is now. The East Dulwich Estate is there now, and the house was above it. But first, we're going to the Triangle in Denmark Hill, where a lot of the very well, the Klein Walks and the family lived. Here is, uh, this is where the pub is now. A few shots of the Triangle. And we'll start with the Platanes, which is, many of you know, King's College's residential uh, for doctors um, and students. Um, and a lot of people only relate it to Klein Walks, but actually uh, it wasn't built by him at all. He came later. It was built by another man of German heritage, heritage George William Egmont Bieber. It was built by the well-known builder Messrs. Coles and Sons, later Trolls and Coles. And Bieber was a South American merchant, but we've come to the conclusion that unbelievably wealthy, unbelievably wealthy. Uh, the house itself, as I say, I don't think it's architected. I think it was designed and built by Coles. It's not a terribly stylish house for the time. But the interesting thing here, he had electricity introduced, and this is 1883. 
one of the first, probably the first house in the area to have electricity. There's a shot of taking the garden front in about 1890. And here's his office, which you will, if those of you who remember, for Fenchurch Street. That was, uh, we saw that earlier. So they were all business together. He was on the first floor and other people. And this is where he moved to after the platain. He moved to this huge house in Weatherby Garden. But the really, to show you how wealthy, I mean, it's not big money by today's standards, but he had been collecting coins um, and then just suddenly decided um, he would relinquish them, as the article says here, he would relinquish the pursuit and sell them. And it was the, in the 19th century, it was the second biggest coin sale that Sotheby's did, and it made just over £8,000, which is a huge sum in those days. And even today, you can see, if you look online to look at numismatists selling coins, they will, part of the, the history will be belong to Egmont Bieber. And these two coins, for example, you could buy a few years ago, now 2014, for £45,000. And here's the, but fabulously wealthy people, fabulously wealthy. But let's go back to Kleinwood. Here's Glebe House, there he is. He'd come over from Germany, set up the bank, and he also set up all his children. His son, Hermann, uh, bought the platanes after Bieber. And we have here a postcard sent by, picked up by uh, Lawrence Marsh in the Herne Hill Society, sent by one of his daughters. Um, so that's actually a postcard from a Kleinwart daughter to a friend in Holland. This is, this is the son, Alexander Kleinwart, they tended to have the same name. So Alexander Kleinwart was the son of Alexander Guiverius Kleinwart. And he was the one who lived at the Platane. And here you have his wife and the seven daughters. You can't say they weren't persistent. But over the road, the two, the, he had two sisters, Sophie Kleinwart, who married a chap called Carla Andre. And they lived at Cristalta, which was the house next door to Platane, again built by Coles and paid for by Alexander Kleinwart Sr. So basically, in his case, not Bank of Mum and Dad, Bank of Dad bought the house for the daughter and her new husband. And similarly, across the road, we have the other daughter, Minnie uh, Kleinwart, who married the non-Germanic sounding Robert Martin, but when you see his other names, you will realize he was a German and he was manager of the Kleinwort Bank, never a partner, um, but he married the other daughter and they lived over the road and presumably uh, Bank of Dad helped on that one as well. So we're just gonna finish off here. I'm just slightly over time to show you a German you won't know, but who's perhaps in many ways more recently has had most impact on Dulwich, and that is Manfred Bregen, the chap with the beard standing there with his glass, uh, who worked for Russell Vernon on the left, on the right here, and Victor Knight. So he worked for Austin and Vernon Partners, architects, and he was the architect for the Christensen Hall. Um, he was the architect where I live in Ferrings and Tolgate Drive. Uh, and all sorts of other buildings in uh, more modern buildings in Dulwich. So we're going to end on that note. So we started at the Oktoberfest, and here is a German who most people don't know, but had a major impact on the area. And that, I think, is the end.